I'd like to extend a sincere and profound sense of appreciation to all of you who've turned up today to thank you for your attendance and to welcome you most of all. I'd also like to, at the very beginning, extend our heartfelt thanks to our panel and our distinguished guest speaker, Professor John Keane, as well as Professor Nu Masolha and Dr. Azam Tamimi. This event today, the inaugural lecture for Abdullah Wahab al Masiri, is the second of two major academic events undertaken by the Middle East Monitor annually. The other being the Palestine Book Awards, now running in its third year. And this year, I'm pleased to announce that we've had over 30 submissions of books from publishers in the United Kingdom, as well as North America and Palestine. But with regard to today's event and the memorial lecture for Abdul Wahab al Masiri, there's no doubt that it is tied into our intent and purpose to celebrate, to encourage, and to promote the scholarship on Palestine. Uh, Abdul Wahab al Masiri, who died in 2008, incidentally passed away in the Palestine Hospital in Cairo. But he dedicated over 30 years of his academic career to the study of Palestine. He's written over 50 books, served in the UN, the Arab League, a permanent mission in New York for a number of years, and as well as a lecturer and chancellor in universities across the Middle East and Asia, right down to Malaysia. I would not uh, delve into his life and times and achievements. Uh, you may perhaps hear from our distinguished panel uh, excerpts uh, from these uh, accomplishments. But what I'd like to say is that uh, we have before us today uh, that lecture titled The New Despotisms in the 21st Century by Professor John Keane. It comes uh, at a time when Egypt, the home country of Abdul Wahab al Masiri, is about to uh, conduct its own presidential elections in a climate of much debate. And so I'm sure uh, what we'd hear today would inform our understanding and appreciation of events in Egypt. Uh, we ask that you cooperate with the chair, Professor uh, Nur Masalha himself a distinguished academic and author on Palestine, himself Palestine, Palestinian born. Uh, please cooperate with him. As well as with the university authorities, uh, we have a contract to display the best decorum and understanding uh, for the rules of the university. Uh, without any further ado, I hand you over to our chair, Professor Nurma Salha. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dawood. Masa um, al-Khair, and good evening. Um, thank you all uh, um, for coming to this first annual memorial lecture in memory of Abraham Masiri. Um, it will be delivered by our guest speaker, uh, Professor John Keynes. I'll say something about John uh, a bit later. Um, uh, but also I want to say something about Abdul Wahab al-Masiri. When I came to do my PhD in London about 30 years ago, I came across um, an Egyptian guy who also came to do a PhD in London. And I asked him, what are you going to do? What are you going to work on? And he said he's, doing, he's going to do a PhD in Jewish history. and he's done Hebrew at um, uh, Ain Shams University. So I was quite surprised that Ain Shams University was actually teaching Hebrew. But I, um, uh, digging slightly more, I discovered that Abdul Wahab Masiri was a professor of, of uh, English literature at Ain Shams University. And I think Abdul Wahab was quite instrumental in the development
development uh, of Hebrew and Israeli studies uh, at Ain Shams University. He actually did his MA at Columbia University, and I think he met Edward Said in the early 60s, and his main area was English literature. Um, but going back to Egypt um, and, and, um, and, and uh, talking to Mohammed Hassanin Haikal, I think they both were keen on this idea of actually developing actually Jewish studies in Egypt, uh, especially after 1967. It was really Haikal who encouraged Mohammed Hassanin Haikal, the famous journalist, who encouraged uh, uh, Abdul Wahab to pursue that um, uh, area of um, uh, Israeli studies and, and uh, Israel and Zionism. And I also had, um, at the time also, I, uh, I had to look also at the encyclopedia Abu Hadashi published at SOAS, this multi-volume encyclopedia. And he does actually make it clear, that distinction between Judaism and Zionism. Um, and that's an important thing for us Palestinians to do. We have always done it. Or we have always done it. And I think that distinction is really what drove Abdul Wahab to see Juda Judaism as part of that um, Arab or Islamic um, Abrahamic tradition um, and was on as a settler colonial movement. Uh, this is something actually we need to make it clear from the beginning. I know um, uh, Azam knows more about Abdul Wahab personally. Uh, I also, also want to say something about Abdul Wahab in terms of his uh, politics. He wasn't a professional politician, but he was the second or third leader of Kifaya, that grassroots movement in Egypt which preceded the Arab uprising and operated nearly about 10 years before the Arab uprising. Um, and he was instrumental, he was contributor to the overthrow of the Mubarak regime. The, the first leaders of Kifaya, enough, enough is enough, the Egyptian movement for change. Al-Harak al-Misri al-Taghir, min agli taghir the way the Egyptians say it. The, the two first leaders of Kifaya actually refused to um, involve members of the Muslim Brothers. And only when he took it over at one point, and Wahab insisted on including everyone in Egypt. This is the lesson, of actually, from, from the politics of Abdul Wahab Masiri, and this is a lesson which we, we are beginning to understand now, um, uh, given the uh, uh, old new despotism which is actually emerging in Egypt now. Uh, without further ado, I want to invite Dr. Ab uh, Azam Tamim to say more about Ab uh, Abdul Wahab Masiri, um, and you definitely you know more about him than me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks uh, to Memo and Dr. Dawood for organizing uh, such uh, uh, an important uh, function. And uh, I'm uh, really delighted that uh, Professor John uh, Keane is the guest speaker. He uh, was my supervisor and uh, my teacher for uh, at least eight years when we were together at the Center for the Study of Democracy in the University of Westminster. And actually, it happened that uh, uh, I uh, knew uh, Abdul Wahab al Masiri because of my association with Professor John Keane. Uh, because as I was uh, working on my uh, PhD, uh, which was investigating transitional problems to democratization uh, in the Arab region, uh, one of the issues that came up was secularism and secularization. And uh, uh, we thought of uh, organizing a workshop uh, on the issue, on Islam and secularism, uh, as part of the activity of the Center for the Study of Democracy. And uh, we came to learn that uh, one of the best authorities in the Arab world on the topic was Professor Abdul Wahab Al Misiri, whom I met accidentally uh, in uh, a conference uh, in Lansing in the United States of America, uh, a conference of the Muslim social scientists. And uh, uh, it was at that time that I told him about my work and my association with Professor John Keane and our uh, intention to organize uh, a workshop on Islam and democracy. And it is uh, as if I brought him the best news uh, he had ever heard because this is a topic that was so dear to himself. Uh, and that workshop in 1994 uh, was uh, truly historic. It's now available in, uh, in a book called Islam and Secularism in the Middle East. But I remember uh, at the time the discussion 
discussions that took place. Uh, people like, for instance, uh, the famous uh, Egyptian journalist Fahmi Wadi came specially from Egypt uh, at his own expense, by the way, to attend the seminar. And he wrote six long pieces about uh, the, the, the workshop, uh, one of uh, which was banned by the authorities in Egypt and is included in a, in a book of his called The Banned Articles or The Banned Pieces, uh, articles which he wrote and were uh, never allowed uh, to be published. Then I knew Abdul Habib Masiri since then for many years until nearly his passing away. The last time I met him was in Cairo in March uh, 2008, just a few months before he passed away, and I visited him in his house, which was like a museum. People who visited him in his house in Cairo will know that he turned his house into a museum. A man who loved arts, who loved culture, and wherever uh, he went, uh, he uh, sought to learn about the local cultures. I spent uh, a fortnight with him in South Africa, touring various South African uh, towns and uh, it was one of the uh, most interesting experiences of my life because when you, you become delighted listening to Abdul Wahab analyzing what he was observing of how people lived, how people interacted and we had meetings with uh, people from all communities including someone we met accidentally uh, at the top of the hill, uh, uh, someone who still believed in apartheid, uh, that was in 1996 and who couldn't uh, live with the uh, transformation that South Africa was going through, so he decided uh, to uh, travel uh, far away and live uh, somewhere on top of a, of a hill because he still believed that the whites were God's uh, preferred uh, race and that uh, they shouldn't be uh, uh, equated with anybody else. Uh, I don't have much time to, uh, you cannot really do much service to Abdul Habib Afendi, in, uh, sorry, to Abdul Habib Misiri uh, in five minutes, but one thing that is of crucial importance about the contribution of Abdul Habib Misiri. It's not just that he wrote about secularism or he wrote about Zionism and that he studied Zionism uh, as a phenomenon of Western secularization. His most profound impact on someone like me coming from an Islamic background and on thousands of uh, students and learners uh, is that he taught us how to analyze things appropriately. Uh, you know, people like myself growing up in a very strict Islamic uh, environment, uh, we thought the world was divided into just black and white. And that's how we judged people, we judged events, we judged everything. And Abdul Wahab al Afandi, uh, so I keep saying Abdul Wahab al Afandi, Abdul Wahab al Misiri, Abdul Wahab al Misiri, Rahmallah taught us that the world was so colorful, it was so mosaic, uh, and uh, that uh, even in the most of gloomy environments, the, there is hope, and uh, there is uh, light, uh, and uh, there is uh, brightness. Uh, I learned uh, from Abdul Wahab al-Misiri, especially with, the, with regard to the Palestinian issue, that the roots of conflict uh, in uh, Palestine have nothing to do with religion, have nothing to do even with ideology. Uh, they are to do with things far away from what we were brought up to think. They are to do with things that were happening in Europe, far away from us. The roots of the conflict that ended up in the occupation of Palestine and in the banishment of millions of Palestinians are in Europe itself, where the Jews were persecuted and were out of the secularization project of Europe came up Zionism with a dream and the dream of creating a homeland for the persecuted Jews on somebody else's land ending up in their own persecution. Very, very finally, this function was very difficult to organize. You know, it was supposed to be at King's College. Then the Zionist lobby used their pressure in order to convince King's College to cancel it. Then we moved here, and there were attempts also to pressure this esteemed uh, university to cancel it. It is regrettable, I, and I must say this, it is really regrettable that in the United Kingdom, universities, uh, great institutions of learning succumb to pressure from, from the Zionist lobby, from the pro-Israel lobby. Universities should open their doors to free speech, to dialogue, 
to exchange of ideas and not just uh, act upon rumors. They told King's College that Abdul Wahab al-Misiri was a Holocaust denial or denier. Anybody who read Abdul Wahab al-Misiri or who knew Abdul Wahab al-Misiri would know that Abdul Wahab, Abdul Wahab al-Misiri always insisted that those who denied the Holocaust were doing a great disservice to history, to mankind, and to the Palestinian issue. For, before, for without the Holocaust, without the Holocaust, Israel could never have come to existence. Thank you very much. To continue my dialogue with Azam, in 2007, I did organize actually a workshop at Birzeit University on democracy from within and from below in the Middle East. And we looked at Hamas, we looked at the Iranian democracy, and we looked at a whole range of ideas in the early 20th century about democracy in the Middle East from below and from within. Uh, the audience at BZ University, which is kind of a leading Palestinian university, was predominantly secular audience. Um, and, but there were a number of people who also were um, coming from that Islamic um, a trend we have. Um, and and um, the, the, the audience actually, it was very difficult actually for me to persuade them um, that um, democracy and secularism is not synonymous, or doesn't have to be synonymous. Um, I mean, here I have to argue with Azam uh, that um, democracy can actually live with secularism as well as live with Islam and with religion. And that kind of dichotomy between secularism um, uh, 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 Islam and secularism and secularism and democracy, I think this is actually one of the problems which we have actually managed to overcome in the Middle East in terms of a, a lot of people thinking uh, uh, a lot of people, young people in Egypt thought that you know, democracy has to go with secularism. And, and, and I think this is a big mistake about Egypt. And also, we, we continue to, to actually dichotomize democracy with secularism, uh, democracy with Islam. Islam and democracy can actually live together. And secularism and democracy actually can also go together. This is something we need to work out. Uh, but this is, this is uh, 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 something I would like to debate with us um, uh, um, on another occasion. Uh, to move on to Professor. Uh, uh, John Keynes, um, professor of policy, actually at uh, Sydney University, and the director of the Institute for the for Democracy and Human Rights at Sydney University. John was the first founder of the Centre for Democracy in London about well, 1989, I think, it roughly, was. roughly, yeah. And but his most famous book, um, The Life and Death of Democracy, was 2009. Was it actually published before that, John? Uh, this was the book about monetary uh, democracy. This is the book which I came across and made you famous. Is it true? <laughs> yeah? He was famous. John, John um, uh, his phenomenal work really, um, working on China, India, New Zealand, the US, uh, his argument about democracy being hijacked, or kind of being transformed since the uh, Second World War, uh, and democracy being becoming, if you like, at least actually taking over democracies and the trappings of democracy, and in fact, in order to maintain and strengthen power, and also disempower civil society. Uh, and this is something perhaps actually we need to think about Egypt in terms of civil society and the autonomy of society. But this is also uh, something that's happening uh, throughout the world, across the world, this idea that elites can actually use democracy, use election in order to strengthen their power. Uh, and to so his exciting um, ideas about civil society, about democracy from below, about um, uh, this is something new to me, and I think if you want to uh, know, about, know more about this, you can forget about Francis Fukuyama and the end of history, or Huntington, um, the third wave or the clash of civilization. You really need to read John. So I think I will leave um, this uh, 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 argument to John about mon monetary democracy. I thought monetary is actually kind of a Latin medieval term. It's about warning, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This is actually that particular connotation if you are using the word monetary mm -hmm. from the word warning. So I, I will leave the gist of the a new despotism uh, in the 21st century uh, to you. Thank you, John.
Gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Masala, and also to Dr. Tamimi. I think I, I have to stand between you before the, the argument begins. So here I am. My function is to, to postpone a debate about secularism and democracy, power, politics, and so on. Uh, friends and colleagues, uh, especially from the Middle East Monitor a web platform that I admire very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, salam alaikum. Um, a new specter is haunting these early years of the 21st century, the specter of despotism. Various powers and types of political regimes are entering into an unholy alliance, an unplanned arrangement that includes red princelings in China, Russian apparatchiks, strong men in Central Asia, oil industry magnates in Brunei, gold-hungry mine owners in South Africa. This alliance of despots is presently loose and cluttered, but its effects are global. This means despotism is most definitely a phenomenon entangled with so-called democracies as we know and experience them. These 21st century despotisms are not going away. They're not passing phenomena. They may well be on the rise, and it's all too easy to imagine in uh, the years and decades to come that they will turn out to be forms of power despotic forms of power that will actually change the institutional dynamics of the global order. For example, for example, for example, in uh, the Asia and Pacific region. Uh, and I would like to say that um, these forms of despotism actually have no precedent. They may well prove to have great resilience. They may turn out to have a remarkable staying power. Despotism. In speaking of the despotisms of the 21st century, I'm aware that in the human sciences uh, and in public life more generally, I'm much out of season, rather out of step using this conceptual language. The term despotism sounds old fashioned. It's so antiquated, it's so time out of mind. That's because during recent decades, most scholars, I think, most journalists, most pundits prefer the fashion of speaking of authoritarianism and authoritarian regimes. Let me mention briefly the case of China, where the booming business of China watching and China assessment has produced an assortment of glib orthodoxies, none more potent than the conclusion that the political system of China is authoritarian. For example, if you read the American businessman, a famous work by James McGregor, he speaks of China as a, a, a one-of-a-kind system of authoritarian capitalism that is in danger of terminating itself and taking the world down with it. Or, to take uh, another instance, surprisingly similar language is used for quite different purposes by the darling of the hard left, the Bolshevik clown Slavoj Žižek, who insists that the virus, and I'm quoting, uh, of authoritarian capitalism is slowly but surely spreading around the globe, nowhere more so than in China. Zizek goes on to question the claim that political democracy is the natural political accompaniment of capitalism by posing a provocative question. What if China's authoritarian capitalism is not a stop on the road to further democratization, but the end state towards which the rest of the world is headed? What these contrasting interpretations of China have in common is their deep attachment to the nebulous notion of authoritarianism and the belief that an authoritarian regime is the opposite of American-style democracy. The claim that authoritarian China is fundamentally at odds with American-style democracy has a notable pedigree. It's in fact traceable to a classic essay on the subject by Samuel Huntington. But in the comments that follow, I want to, to question this uh, key term, authoritarianism, and the appropriateness of this term. I would like to uh, encourage you to nurture your own sense of wonder about the myriad dramatic and contradictory and novel things that are happening in the world of arbitrary power. 
My arguments caution against closed minds, along the way inviting you to admit uncertainties, to explore your own ignorance and mine too. Above all, to see that contemporary despotisms are no simple or straightforward actuality, but instead comprise a cauldron of contradictions, a kaleidoscope of confusing and conflicting trends, a reality which ought to make us feel, in matters of observation, the truth of the common saying that in these times all of us rather resemble the blind person sizing up different parts of an elephant that cannot be summarized in simple terms. So how should we proceed? It may seem strange or fatuous to begin by saying that understanding the new 21st century despotisms and the threats they pose to monetary democracy is for me a state of mind, a way of using words, which really count when analyzing these despotisms. Language matters in politics, and it also matters in the uh, analysis and probing and poking of power, which is why I reject the prevailing orthodox language of authoritarianism. Those commentators and critics who suppose that authoritarian regimes like Russia or China or Saudi Arabia are politry, the polities tottering through a transition towards and at odds with American-style liberal democracy, itself the standard by which despotism should be adjudged, are mistaken, in my view, on both normative and strategic grounds. Despotisms are not proto-liberal democracies. My objection is not that this way of describing things destroys the precious meaning and rich political significance of the root word authority, which it does. My refusal of the term authoritarianism tonight is not primarily grounded in normative objections. For instance, the presumption that American-style liberal democracy is the highest standard by which uh, these uh, despotisms are to be measured and judged. In what follows, I instead want to show that when you used as a, uh, a synonym for haughty power, the term authoritarianism wildly underestimates the kaleidoscopic quality of the new despotisms, their disturbing qualities, above all, their proto-democratic techniques of rule of people struggling to live their lives often under difficult conditions. In sum, the grip of phrases such as authoritarianism, authoritarian rule, authoritarian capitalism needs to be broken, arguably because their popularity stems from their imprecision, hence from their malleability in the hands of a wide range of scholars and journalists, politicians and pundits, all of whom like to portray regimes such as China, Vietnam, Saudi Arabia as authoritarian regimes, usually to suit their own undeclared scholarly and political standpoints, which are all too often supposed without justification that liberal democracy is the highest standard of, uh, for judging these regimes. So I return to the concept of despotism. It's a concept, you may know, with an astonishing history. It had its roots in ancient Greece, where the word despotes referred to the legitimate, presumed to be benevolent rule of a father over his wife and children and slaves within the household. The word actually survived into modern European times, and it was revived with great gusto uh, sometime around the 16th uh, century. There were two overlapping phases in the uh, revival of uh, the revival of this old uh, Greek category of the despot. In the first phase, the term despotism was largely a term used to differentiate Christian Europe from powers to the east. Despotism was a term of abuse. It was a key word uh, in the European imaginary to castigate the east. It was a concept that functioned as the heir to the Christian dis disparagement of the world of Islam. Usually, it was Ottoman Turkey, which was in the sights uh, of uh, those who used the term despotism. And this meant despotism, in the case of Ottoman Turkey, was synonymous with hypocrisy, licentiousness, and baseness. 
symbolized by the Sultan's Seraglio. Here is uh, Delacroix's famous painting uh, from the early 1830s. Despotism was seen in this first phase as the inversion and subversion of natural law. The decrees of the Sultan ruler were based on arbitrary will, or so it was said, not reason. Property belonged to individuals, and not to individuals, but to the Sultan. Nobility not being hereditary, the natural order of ranks was routinely violated. Women subverted the just rule of men. Darker races subverted the more natural rule of whites. I'm just describing here the literature, uh, this early literature on despotism. Uh, widespread ignorance resulted from the state ban on printing presses. Currency, constantly debased, was worthless. Rampant homosexuality meant a declining population. The whole political order centered on the Sultan Seraglio was a space of unimaginable decadent luxury. That was phase one. Phase two uh, in the modern reception of the category of despotism is more interesting because sometime during the 18th century in particular, the phantom of despotism, that was the phrase by an 18th century French writer named Anquetil du Perron, the phantom of despotism became a contagion. There was an intense debate about this category, above all because there were many uh, scholars and writers who began to say that the phenomenon of despotism was a European problem. That is to say, it may have had roots in the East, but it was actually a virus that was spreading into uh, the West. That, in other words, European monarchies were beginning to resemble despotisms elsewhere. For instance, by arbitrarily uh, trying to increase their tax base, or suppressing religious minorities, or regulating the organs of public opinion that protested against arbitrary power, even to win the consent of those whom they subjugated. Montesquieu was uh, in this uh, period, here he is, the French uh, writer was the one who contributed enormously to the revival of the category of despotism in this uh, second phase. And during this second phase, the term itself becomes an aggressive uh, political term. Its circulation, we would say today, becomes, uh, became viral. There was much talk of the monster of despotism, and there was fear that despotism uh, would actually bring about an end to European uh, freedoms from within Europe itself. It was a certain edification, the category. It was an edification of the horribleness of uh, a future without uh, freedoms, uh, a future that was governed by arbitrary power. And so the category became a deadly weapon in the resistance to arbitrary power. It had the quality, we would say today, of a meme. That is, the figure of the despot featured, uh, for example, during the revolt of the American colonists against the British Empire. It's one of the most common terms to describe the British Empire among the American colonists. It was, as Michel Foucault pointed out, uh, also uh, an important figure in the build-up to the French Revolution. The political monster, as he put it, of despot turned out to be a polarizing concept. It alerted people to the dangers of arbitrary power. And uh, the uh, history of the concept in this period, in the 18th uh, century, uh, penetrated all kinds of areas, including I came across this reference to an exchange of letters between John Adams, who would become the president of the United States, and uh, his uh, wife, Abigail Adams. Abigail Adams writes to John Adams in the year of the revolution, 1776, and she says, do not put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands. She's appealing to him to think about uh, different laws that would uh, enfranchise women. And he writes back uh, to say that we know better than to repeal our masculine systems because, he went on to argue, everybody knows that women rule men, so that changing laws in favor of women would completely subject us to the despotism of the petticoat. Despotism of the petticoat. You can see that the remarkable thing about this category uh, and the language of of the despot and despotism 
has revolutionary consequences in this uh, period. And you will also know that in the 19th century, there were writers like the Scotsman James Mill and Marx himself who used this category to describe uh, the East and to describe also certain tendencies in the European heartlands. But alas, for reasons that have much to do with the rise of the language of democracy, uh, the category begins to disappear during the 19th century. It becomes a dead concept, uh, so to say, a political thought of yesteryear. And so tonight, I want to make a case uh, to you to revive this term, to revive it uh, despite its checkered history, uh, despite the fact that it feels old-fashioned, that it belongs to a bygone era. And I want to do so for three reasons, very briefly. The reasons for uh, resurrecting this category, first of all, have to do with the normative sting in its tail. This is uh, a category that does not automatically belong to, so to say, the liberal or Anglo-American or, let's say, straightforwardly Western tradition. Uh, the whole point of the category is to highlight the problem of arbitrary exercises of power. When power is exercised without good public justifications for why it does what it does, where it bullies and bosses, this, uh, the category of despotism, uh, alerts us to the dangers, it alerts us, it sensitizes us to this uh, problem. If you like, uh, the concept of despotism is a foghorn. It's an early warning signal. It's a power monitoring concept. You could say that tonight I'm going to deliver to you something like a counterfactual thought experiment. I want you to see of what life would be like without power sharing democracy. Imagine a world where despotism prevails. Uh, so there is a warning built in to the concept. Second. Despotism has a certain strategic value in that it raises questions, critical questions, about how practically to deal with forms of power that have this strange and threatening architecture. If I call uh, Yanukovych, or I call Muammar Gaddafi, or I call Abdel Fattah al-Sisi a despot, the language is strong, and it's intended to be so. The term is what the Germans would call a Kampfbegriff, uh, a concept designed to cause political trouble by raising questions about power and how to restrain power in practice. Consider the close to home case of the emerging Egyptian despotism. To call this regime, which terrorizes and takes the lives of its citizens by its proper name, is to cast grave doubts on the credibility of those, for example, Tony Blair, in his interview on the 9th of July 2013, who claim, as he did, that because Egypt was, as he put it, sliding into total chaos, military intervention was necessary and a vital condition of moving to democratic elections, whereas he added uh, uh, in uh, April 2014, just last month, uh, the importance of propping up uh, this uh, new uh, regime is that it is, uh, together with Putin's Russia, potentially an alliance for fighting radical Islam. So to say that Tony Blair is here defending despotism is not just a redescription of his words. Rather than using euphemisms, it is to do what almost certainly Professor El Masiri would have done to call things by their proper name, so raising practical strategic questions about how best in practice to break the tightening grip of this Egyptian des despotism. The third reason is the least obvious reason for uh, trying to revive this category. Especially during the 18th century, the concept of despotism spotlighted a strange paradox that I think remains critically important until this day. The paradox is this, that those who exercise arbitrary power over others can develop the arts of democratically ruling them using mechanisms that have the effect of integrating, of interpolating subjects who in turn allow themselves to give their consent upon which the despotism happily nourishes itself. To put it very crudely, despotisms have democratic qualities. And that should disturb us. And what I want to do tonight is to develop that idea, which 
uh, could be said to be something like a silent contract. That is, when despotisms prove durable, they manage in practice to develop throughout the regimes a kind of silent contract with their subjects who consent, in quotation marks, to the continuation of arbitrary power. That idea actually was uh, first uh, developed in um, Al-Sisi. Uh, this was first developed uh, in the writings of uh, uh, Alexei de Tocqueville. And if my slide there is the text for you to read, um, the gist of it is that Tocqueville, the French, aristocratic uh, liberal who travels to America, who writes uh, one of the great classic works of uh, reflection on modern democracy, Democracy en Amérique, uh, in the second volume, asks the question of what type of despotism democratic nations should fear. And what Tocqueville argues in uh, that uh, great uh, 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 section is that one of the dangers that lies on the horizon uh, of the modern democratic revolution is the possibility that regimes will be born that will speak the name of the people, that will act as if they are on, uh, that they are benevolent and that they, they are for the best interests of their subjects, but where the whole regime turns out to be unbreakable and frighteningly despotic, as Tocqueville says. Well, enough preamble ramble. My attempt to clarify the meaning and possible usages of this uh, key and loaded term makes clear that the concept of despotism has a history. Its meaning has varied through time and space. And that provides me with the license for asking the fundamental question, is it a useful concept for our times? Supposing it is, what exactly defines the new despotisms of the 21st century? What are the secrets of their success? Are these despotisms fated to play a leading role in our political lives in the coming years of the 21st century? One way of providing answers to these tough and testing questions is to imagine taking a Tocqueville-style journey into the Asia-Pacific region, broadly defined here to include the geographic space that stretches from Turkey, the Gulf states, Iran in the west, through the Central Asian republics, China and Japan, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand. I pick on this region because it's well known that it contains the bulk of the world's population. In the current Atlantic crisis, it has out-invested, out-produced, out-exported the rest of the world. The world's future is currently being forged there, I would say. It is the new geopolitical center of gravity of our planet. It's also the heartland of the new despotisms, which are proving to be powerful actors in the region. I include under this category regimes such as uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, the UAE, Turkmenistan, China, and Brunei. Note that these despotisms are members of various regional bodies. In this sense, despotism should not be thought of simply as a type of territorial state, and that these despotisms radiate their effects well beyond the borders of territorial states. Despotism is a phenomenon I put to you with global potential. But what exactly do these regimes have in common? What follows is an attempt to use the category of despotism as an ideal type. And I use this in a technical social science term. I mean that the trends I'm going to describe to you, to analyze, to reflect upon, aren't to be found anywhere in their pure form on the face of the earth. There is no model extant despotism. In a way, I'm using the category of despotism as a dystopia. But I put to you that there are regimes that embody more or less some or all of the following eight qualities. I want to begin with uh, the first um, feature of these despotisms. I call this Guangxi, the Chinese term patron client states. Those of you who think 
And there are many social scientists who have, in recent uh, decades, that clientelism, patron-client relations, uh, ways of handling power, belong to traditional societies that they wither away. Actually, when you look at these despotisms, you see they are making a tremendous comeback. What I mean by this is that these are regimes where Guangxi, where uh, organized forms of clientelism are in a way one of the structuring principles of the regimes. Goods, services, and especially money are exchanged for political support at all levels of the regime in a sort of nested uh, power arrangement way. Despotism naturally uh, sustains corruption, and corruption naturally nurtures as despotism. A daily culture of amorality, of cynicism, of opportunism, of who cares, flourishes under despotic conditions. Sometimes this involves paying off everyone uh, who matters, a kind of demimonde of journalists, bureaucrats, legislators, judges, opinion pollsters, celebrities, and business people. It's a top-down, vertically organized uh, power uh, of asymmetric relations between patrons and clients. The motto of despotisms is something like this. I give you this, you take that. And on that we agree. And it flourishes to the perceived advantage of all parties. Wang Shi, of course, produces a great deal of selectivity in access to key resources, whether it be schooling or reputation or jobs or money or factories or guns. Those with access, the patrons, and the myriad of sub-patrons and brokers depend upon the subordination and dependence uh, and acceptance by uh, their clients. Now, I've said that this um, clientelism is supposedly a hangover from uh, former times, from political underdevelopment, but it seems to me if you uh, look at the anatomy of the regimes I'm beginning to describe, you will see that patron-client relations are a basic structuring principle. Second feature. Plutocracy. This word is making a comeback in our times, partly because of people like Thomas Piketty. The despotisms of our time are forms of governing power that are deeply dependent upon concentrations of capital. They follow, in a way, Deng Xiaoping's first principle. Quote, let some people get rich first. This could be uh, something like an anthem to most of these uh, despotisms. Indeed, uh, in these despotisms, vast fortunes are made. Mostly, markets are not free. Uh, Daniel Kimmage has, in fact, argued that um, these regimes should be described as curdocracies. There is actually a word in the Oxford uh, Dictionary, a form of rule based on the desire for material uh, gain. That captures the point, symbolized, uh, if you look at the unfolding Turkish mine disaster, uh, by media revelations of a dark underbelly of the Edoyan government. That is, cozy and corrupt links between government officials and business tycoons, such as Al Gurkan, CEO of the Soma Holding Company, a pro AKP businessman who has boasted publicly of lowering his operating costs, a coal tycoon, a symbol, a symbol uh, of 21st century despotism linked directly to the AKP's election time tactic of handing out free coal to voters, a man who admitted in the past few days that he hadn't visited the Soma mine and he hadn't done so for three years. The case of Gurkhan shows how the profoundly corrupted elites of despotism care first and foremost for manipulating the machinery of the state to serve their private business interests. They run something of a wealth protection racket. They're hooked on lavish dinners, carefully vetted marriages, access to celebrities. They like their champagne. They go on luxury uh, holidays in secluded locations. The struggling poor are of little or no interest to them, they'll say privately. True, in despotisms of the 21st century, there's much big talk from the top. Despotisms come clothed in ideologies. There's talk of national interest and national solidarity. There's talk of law and order and protection from foreign enemies. There's talk of the creation of a new political order through revolution. There's talk of divine inspiration and illusions of climbing Jacob's ladder to heaven, as in Iran. 
There's also talk of anti-imperialism or ethnic mobilization, and there are displays of benevolence. But in fact, none of this is the reality. The reality is that these are deeply plutocratic regimes. Third, the most stable despotisms in our times are those that enjoy the support of the middle class. These new despotisms promote a certain form of embourgeoisement, but the middle classes that result are quite comfortable with despotism. Concentrated in interconnected cities such as Guangzhou, Nanchang, Singapore, Bandar Seri Bagawan, Moscow, Budapest, Ho Chi Minh City, Riyadh, middle class chains of interdependence are heavily uh, interconnected and concentrated in the Asia and Pacific region. You may know, ladies and gentlemen, that a 2010 OECD report predicts that the size of the global middle class will increase from 1.8 billion people to 3.2 billion people by 2020, and maybe to 4.9 billion uh, by 2030. Almost all of the growth, around 85%, it's predicted, will come uh, from the Asia Pacific region. And the same pattern is expected in the growth of their purchasing power. Uh, what is interesting uh, or disturbing about this trend is that these middle classes are, politically speaking, promiscuous. You know that Tocqueville in the 19th century worried about the behavior of the middle classes. He worried that they would become preoccupied with their own material interests, their own uh, uh, petty pleasures, as he put it, and that they would take their eyes off um, the problem of power, that they would cease being citizens. They would become consumers, as we would say today. One of the lessons um, of the despotisms of our time uh, is that uh, uh, I think Tocqueville was onto something. And it certainly works against, for instance, the Barrington Moore thesis. It works against uh, Seymour Martin Lipset and uh, Francis Fukuyama's thesis, because the middle class have no automatic affinity with power sharing democracy. In oil rich countries such as Saudi Arabia, Brunei, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates, the middle classes, guided by fear and greed and professional and family honor and respectability, seem happy to be co opted or to be kidnapped by state rulers, willing to be bought off with lavish services and cash payments and invisible benefits. And that's certainly true for Russia, and it may well turn out to be true for the case of China, where one of the great political questions of our age is whether the expanding middle classes will opt for regime stability by way of an acceptance of a predatory state that ensures that uh, they can cash in on the boom by getting uh, rich as quickly as possible in accordance with that Deng Xiaoping principle of self-enrichment.